Hey, I'm Ryan Reynolds. At Mint Mobile, we like to do the opposite of what Big Wireless does. They charge you a lot, we charge you a little. So naturally, when they announced they'd be raising their prices due to inflation, we decided to deflate our prices due to not hating you. That's right. We're cutting the price of Mint Unlimited from $30 a month to just $15 a month. Give it a try at mintmobile.com slash switch. $45 up front payment equivalent to $15 per month. New customers on first three-month plan only. Taxes and fees extra. Speed slower above 40 gigabytes. See details. My dad works in B2B marketing. He came by my school for career day and said he was a big ROAS man. Then he told everyone how much he loved calculating his return on ad spend. My friends still laugh at me to this day. Not everyone gets B2B, but with LinkedIn, you'll be able to reach people who do. Get a hundred dollar credit on your next ad campaign. Go to LinkedIn.com slash results to claim your credit. That's LinkedIn.com slash results. Terms and conditions apply. LinkedIn, the place to be to be. You know, I've been talking about earned media value for quite some time on this podcast. My friends at Eisenberg have just raised the bar on earned media benchmarks with their social index. Social Index now gives you globally earned media values across a growing list of six geographies for all your KPIs across the top seven social platforms, Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, Snapchat, TikTok, Twitter, and YouTube. You can now visualize these values for deeper analysis, and they have a look-back window over two years of historical comparisons. Social Index is updated daily. Don't get stuck with old data. Over 1,000 companies have used the social index to understand the ROI of their social campaigns. And if you work with a social agency, you should demand they incorporate earned media values into your reports. Get your earned media value for social content. Visit earnedmediavalues.com slash Allen. Again, that's earnedmediavalues.com slash A-L-A-N. For all of us, it's about predicting where the consumer is going and getting half of it right. One of the things we want to do is create ads that don't suck. Embracing change creates great possibility. I'm Alan Hart, and this is Marketing Today. Today on the show, I've got Ryan Bonici. He's the Chief Marketing Officer for WellHub, previously known as Jim Pass. Ryan brings over 15 years of experience in places like Salesforce, HubSpot, G2, and Microsoft, and was named one of 2020's world's most influential CMOs by Forbes. Ryan now leads a team of over 300 professionals at WellHub, where his main goal is to make well-being a priority for employees globally. Now on the show today, we talk about the rebrand from Jim Pass to WellHub. We talk about the journey that they went on to do that. We also talk about what marketing looks like as they market to B2B, B2C, and B2P or B2 partners. And we also talk about a fun entertainment marketing tactic that they launched, which is a fictional podcast called Murder in HR. You do not want to miss this episode with Brian Benici. Ryan, welcome back to the show. Hey, Alan, it's so nice to be back here with you. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah, no, I, I'm excited for this conversation. I think before we get into the business side of it, I, I hear you've mastered getting wellness into your week. And man, I could really use some help. So I don't know what you're doing, how you block <laughs> your time, but like any tips you can provide, I will be soak it all up. Yeah, so I really do live the mission, I guess I would say, at WellHub. But maybe tell me a little bit more about what does wellness look like to you? Because I think that's the thing is what everyone needs and what will keep folks well is it's so personal to each person. So what have I mean, you tried that has worked? Tell yeah. me a little bit more about your wellness experience, if you will. <laughs> yeah, so I try to get a strenuous workout in at least three times a week, hopefully four. I'm CrossFit is my go-to for that. Um, oh, nice. Yeah. yeah. I started wearing a Whoop device. I don't know if you're mm-hmm. familiar with Whoop. Hey, uh, oh, Alan, don't get me started on wearables. <laughs> I literally, on me, on my person right now, I have a Garmin that's doing like continuous heart rate, pulse ox, all of that fun stuff. I am wearing an Aura ring. I'm wearing a Whoop. And 
<laughs> sometimes I'm wearing a continuous glucose monitor because I like to <laughs> test myself with wow. that every now and then. So I'm like, I am deep into this. I love, I like love it though. Like it's a passion for me, I think. And I love numbers, which is why I love marketing. And so I love being able to measure improvements in all of the stats that all of those devices track. They all kind of track slightly different things, which is why I use several of them. And I've used them for a long time. So I'm, I'm, I've been grandfathered in with some of them. So I'm not paying like a monthly subscription to all of them, which would become, yeah. become quite excessive quite quickly if I was. But I, I love it. And for me, it's I'm a morning person. So like I wake, I woke up at 4.30 this morning. I was at the pool at 5 a.m. I swam two kilometers and back home by 7 a.m. Like before most people are, are getting up. And so for me, I, I just have to get it in really early. Because mm. if I leave it to later in the day, then like nighttime Ryan starts to make decisions for me, which like doesn't make the best <laughs> decisions and I'll put off the workout. Is nighttime Ryan fun, Ryan? <laughs> no, I, I like to think that I'm fun at all times, Al. <laughs> but, but no, I think no, it's actually the opposite. I'd say nighttime Ryan is more like tired, like and lazy and mm. doesn't want to do those kinds of things. Whereas in the morning, like I've gotten a good routine where like my alarm goes off and I just get up before I start to think. I think that's mm. the trick is like when your alarm goes off, you give yourself five seconds to get out of bed and you like, it just forces you to be on autopilot. And then yeah. but before you know it, you're at the gym and you haven't even had the chance to be like, oh, do I really want to be here? Blah, blah, blah. That works <laughs> for me. All right. My, my trick. I'll try to, the five seconds to get out of bed piece is probably something I can work on. I'll work that mm, into my yeah, routine. Because yeah. otherwise you, you start to look at your phone and next thing. Exactly. You That's the key. You can't, you can't really get onto your devices before you get to the gym. I've found if I do otherwise, then I just yeah. get caught in things. And then it's the trade-off of, oh, I've got all these things to do. Yeah. Imagine what I could get done when I could be at the gym. And <laughs> then I don't end up doing it. Doing it. Oh. Awesome. And I find cool. as well for me, I don't know about you, but the days that I go to the gym or do some kind of wellness activity, which to be honest is most days, like they're the days that I perform at my best. I'm so much more effective. I, I'm so oh, much yeah. more tolerant of like my, my son's four. He's got tons of energy. Uh, and so I need a lot to be with him and to be at his level. And if I haven't worked out, I find I get frustrated so much more easily. So yeah, I, I'm all about the, the early morning workout. I love it. Love it. I'll try to do that and adopt your five seconds and up. We'll see how it goes. I'll let you know. Good luck. Um, let me know. But so from hacking your own health and wellness, you are now the CMO at Hub, which was previously known as Gym Pass. Tell me a little bit about the path. Like where I know you've been on the show before, but like maybe for listeners that may have missed that episode, like where did you get your start in your career and kind of what were some of the stops along the way to get you where you are today? Yeah, sure thing. So maybe just like to set the scene for folks who don't know. So WellHub is the world's leading corporate wellness platform. I've, I've been here for a little over two years, maybe two and a half years now. We have around 15,000 clients around the world and they rely on us to provide their employees access to some of the best corporate well-being partners around the world across a few different pillars. So fitness, mindfulness, therapy, nutrition, and sleep. They're like just like the, the classes or the groupings of which we coordinate our well-being partners. And so we're B2B to C as a company. So we sell to companies and then we essentially market to activate and get their employees to adopt and engage with our product. But I, I think I started my career in marketing to start rewind back to the very beginning in the early 2000s. I feel like when blogging was beginning and the blogs were starting to go into e-commerce, I was one of the few marketers at a blog called The Cool Hunter and was working with that the founder of that company to help them start to sell through their website and started in consumer marketing and then did more consumer marketing at Microsoft joined the company called Salesforce for a, a, their exact their acquisition, sorry, of exact target. Mm. So I started in B2C, then I got pretty big B2B enterprise marketing experience, which I loved. But I always wanted to start my own company at some point in time. And so I knew that if I was going to do that, I'd need to be able to know how to do 
really is like ROI positive marketing or scrappy marketing, if you will. And at that time, I was in Salesforce. I was running multi-million dollar events and they were driving a lot of revenue for our sales team. But I knew that I wouldn't have a multi-million dollar budget if I started my own company. And at that time, HubSpot was just entering the Asia Pacific market. They were looking for someone who had helped US companies roll out in in JPAC. And so I I came up with them and really learned the inbound marketing, inbound sales methodology and really helped HubSpot scale in in APAC. I then moved to Boston with with HubSpot and took on a global brand and and social and PR related role. So something a little bit more, I'd say like more on like the softer side of marketing. I think I really sharpen my sore, if you will, on the revenue side of marketing. And that's probably the area that I am most drawn to just because it is so black and white objective. Like success is very clear. There's no gray area around success when it comes to revenue marketing. Whereas I think in brand marketing, it's a little bit more subjective. And I love it, that side of marketing, but I, I like it, I think, only in combination with revenue marketing. And so when I took on that brand role at HubSpot, I think I learned pretty quickly in the the six months of doing that, that I couldn't do brand marketing alone. I really needed revenue. Around that time, G2 was looking for a CMO and they tapped me on the shoulder for that, which was around the time I think you and I spoke last. Yeah. And and so, yeah, spent a bunch of time rebranding G2, albeit though it was more of a, a visual rebrand and, to, and look and feel rebrand and positioning rebrand. With regards to the name, we just dropped the crowd, right? So it wasn't like we had to reintroduce ourselves per se and, and really teach people. It was just G2 crowd to G2. So a hell of a lot easier. Also, we were an English only website, right? We only sold in English speaking markets, mm-hmm. much simpler. Whereas at, at WellHub, we're in 11 different countries around the world many of which speak different languages. We have a huge localization team within marketing. The rebrand was a whole lot more complicated. But yeah, yeah, it's been a journey, I think, over the last 15 years. And I kind of love always moving into a new part of marketing or a new segment or a new go-to-market motion and, and learning it. And I think the best marketers, in my opinion, are the ones that aren't one trick ponies. They're the marketers that have been able to see different industries, see different go to markets, sell and market to different you know, sizes of companies, sell different products, sell to different personas. I think I think that is what to me makes the best marketers. It's what I look for when I'm hiring people too. All right. Awesome. You already highlighted a little bit like what Hub is, but what are you guys looking to accomplish? What's your mission? Where do you want to go, if you will? Yeah, this is very like top of mind and fresh for me because of the rebrand. Our goal as a company is to make every other company a wellness company. And what we mean by that, maybe what's at the core of that is typically the biggest cost for any company is that people take up a huge portion of any company's budget. And I think over the last like 10, 20 years, we've spent a lot of time, I think, as companies, as executives, trying to think about how do we get our people to produce as much as they can? How do we give them the tools like Asana and Slack to be as efficient as possible? And I think the reality is if the people using those tools aren't well, then your company isn't going to be well in the long run, right? Like Mm -hmm. wellness is a marathon. Growing a company is a marathon. It's not a sprint. And so with this notion of helping every company become a wellness company is really what it at the core of what we do. And we want every company and every employee at those companies to check in with their well-being every day. And we have so many partners. What it's like 55,000 wellness partners around the world now. So there's, there's a category of partner of which you can check in with each day, if not multiple times a day. Um, so that, That's um, awesome. I mean, yeah. I, I didn't realize, one, I didn't realize how many countries you guys were in. And then two... 55,000 wellness partners. That's a lot of choice too. Yeah, it's a lot of choice. And it is crucial really. If you think of it at the end of the day, like our, our product to, to, to a big degree is our network right, of partners. And it's what drives widespread employee adoption and engagement. Right. So if when we sell to a company, it's their employees that are getting access to this huge network that we've built and that we continue to build right every year, we're adding more and more partners to that network in more and more locations and more and more disciplines. So the product keeps getting better and better. 
And all of that really like drives positive return on investment for our clients, right? They see better employee experience and satisfaction. They see workforces that are more productive. They see 40% less turnover in their employees. And they're even starting to see now significant reductions in their healthcare costs of their employees. I think the most recent research we did with some of our clients in Brazil, we saw that they were saving up to 35% on healthcare costs because their employee base was becoming healthier and was leveraging their insurance policy less. So they were able to negotiate the lower premiums on their healthcare. So we show all of that meaningful ROI to companies to help them understand why this isn't just a good decision slash a great perk for employees. This is literally a business growth lever that makes your employees happier and more productive. And in doing so, it makes your company better, grow faster, grow more um, healthier. Yeah, it's an interesting sort of shift over the last few years, Alan, from like selling more pure B2B and selling more utilities that people use for work, right? Selling CRM or marketing Mm -hmm. tools. It's I love being able to still sell and market in that same go-to-market of B2B. But at the end of the day, we're really we're really helping activate a somewhat consumer esque product within their employee base. Um, right. And so it's I don't know. I love being able to shop in my B two B and my B two C marketing minds. Got it. Well, talk to me about the journey you went on to rebrand Going from Gym Pass to Wellhub. Like you said, much more complicated than going from and what happened there. How did you start that process? And maybe what was the process that you followed? Yeah, look, I was really fortunate in that when I joined the company really early on, and maybe even in the interview process, I I knew this was something that was on the horizon. And it, it really was out of this idea that during COVID, the company really quickly was able to roll out digital and virtual fitness and wellness partners really quickly, right? So because gyms and studios were closing down really quickly for COVID, the company knew they needed to have products and services that their clients, employees could use during COVID. And so over sort of 2020, like 2020 to sort of 2020, we really leaned into these other pillars, right? Mindfulness, digital offerings, personal trainers remotely, nutritionists, one-to-one coaching, all of these other sort of pillars in wellness. And it was where we saw the company going. And it was where we were describing the company going when we were talking to prospective clients as well as customers. And I think it was many customers that in fact were saying to us like, hey, like you do so much more than just gyms. The name slowed us down in the buying process. Had we have known you did all these other things, we would have bought sooner. So we started to hear that and the company was already hearing that before I joined. And so they'd already begun the process of starting to consider names. There was already a short list of names on the table. And I think after I joined, we started to change the strategy somewhat. And I didn't feel like we had landed on the name yet. And I don't know if you've ever been through the process of, of trying to find a new name, Alan, but <laughs> it's it not tough. about trying to find a new name. It's about trying to find a new name also that, that exists out there in the world, right? Ideally, there's right. .com the domain that you can buy. Ideally, like the social handles, you can get all of them. So it's, and it's getting harder and harder now because there are so many people that sit on domain names, so, so many people that sit on social handles and so, yeah there's a ton of different sort of roadblocks to <laughs> to get through for that but ultimately at the end of the day the rebrand really aligns our name with our mission which as i mentioned before is to make every company a wellness company and it's, i think for me rebrands are the best when they're not an initiative that marketing is driving but they're an initiative that's connected deeply to company strategy to me that's when a rebrand is right. I think if Mm -hmm. it's just the marketing team driving it because they think the old name is passe or or whatnot, then I I tend to find those rebrands are are less positively received or even potentially internally within the company themselves are are less positively accepted. And I think very early on, internally, the, the former Gym Pass team was super on board and super excited to go down this journey, which for a marketing team makes it a lot easier. You don't want to be 
dealing with pushback internally. And so, yeah, it was a, gosh, it was about a, a, an 18 month process, the rebrand. But I think because we had so much time to go through it, we really were able to execute it. I, I'd say like almost flawlessly, like there were little mm-hmm. things and hiccups here and there, but for the most part, we didn't have you know, any things that we weren't expecting which to, to launch a rebrand in 11 different markets around the world overnight was, was no a small task. task. Yeah, yeah. 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 No small yeah, task. And especially like with multiple audiences, right? Like we, we don't just sell to one audience, right? We're essentially a three-sided marketplace, right? We have our partners, we have our, our HR clients, then we have their employees. And so the message to each of those stakeholders is very different. The timing of which and how we ordered the sequencing of who we told when and how it's also really important. So yeah, it was it was a very complicated process. And I'm really fortunate that I had some really great people on my team who, who really led the charge, making it pretty easy for me, to, given they're all great. My dad works in B2B marketing. He came by my school for career day and said he was a big row ass man. Then he told everyone how much he loved calculating his return on ad spend. My friends still laugh at me to this day. Not everyone gets B2B, but with LinkedIn, you'll be able to reach people who do. Get a $100 credit on your next ad campaign. Go to linkedin.com slash results to claim your credit. That's linkedin.com slash results. Terms and conditions apply. LinkedIn, the place to be, to be. What does marketing look like at WellHub? You talked about the B2B to C model. I'd love to know, what does the function look like? What do you guys do? Yeah, I don't think it looks too dissimilar from most sort of B2B companies. I have a half a dozen teams under me. So content marketing, comms and social, product marketing, brand marketing. I think where it is a little different or where you start to see the B2B to C component is we have revenue marketing teams and we have a B2B revenue marketing team, or I think other companies might just call this demand gen or growth, but we have B2B demand gen growth. We have a B2C demand gen growth team, which is focused on activating employees at our clients. And then we have a B2P, so business to partners, demand generation and growth team that's really focused on working with our partner team to acquire partners, onboard them and and make them as successful as possible. And then, yeah, what other teams we have? Marketing operations, which is everything from web to martech, campaign management, my, who am I missing? My team right now. I'm always <laughs> hiring new people and the team's growing. So I'm very likely missing a function. <laughs> but um, that gives you a little bit of a snapshot of what the team looks like today. And But I'd say a big portion of what we do is like B2B marketing, right? To help acquire right. new companies for our sales team. And then we then tend to use owned channels such as email, push notifications for our app, in-app messages social retargeting to then convert employees into paid subscribers. Yeah, that makes sense. That makes a lot of sense. You've got a lot of marketing going on, a lot of different constituencies. Yeah, we do. It's a pretty big team as well. And I think it's quite big because of the fact that we are marketing and driving growth of several audiences in this three-sided marketplace. But I, I, to be honest, wouldn't have it any other way. I love the complexity of it. I love the the weighing up of the trade-offs between investing in different areas, considering like for every dollar I invest into B2B versus B2C versus B2P, what are my returns? How do I think about the different allocations of those budget investments, time Mm -hmm. investments? So I I geek out on that stuff. (laughs) Love it. I love it. One of the things that caught my eye as I was doing some research is something you've been doing or historically have done with a fictional podcast called Murder and HR that your company backed. And like this whole notion of branded entertainment is something that I'm interested in to begin with. Mm-hmm. But I would love your take on where did this idea come from? Like, how did you make it happen? And what have been, how's it worked out for you? Yeah, this is such a fun project. Maybe before I go into this, I'll, I'll just so philosophically, Alan, my like view on these kinds of things, branded entertainment or Maybe what I would put this in the bucket of sort of like experimentation, trying new things, taking risks. Right. I'm like a big believer in that, like you don't own the right to do any of those things until 
you are driving like a meaningful amount of revenue for your business through marketing. Marketing <laughs> at WellHub is responsible for about 95% of all of SMB revenue. Like we source all of that inbound for the sales team. And then for, for our enterprise segments, I think we source roughly 30% of, of all revenue. And so we've grown that dramatically since I joined. We've really been able to help the sales team scale their own revenue goals. And so once we started to get all of that underway and feeling we were driving revenue in a really predictable, sustainable, um, reliable, cost-effective way, then we started to explore other things. And I know one of the things we were exploring was was multimedia content, right? Video, mm-hmm. audio, podcasts. And there's a lot of those things that kind of connect with our buyer persona, right? And I, I may have mentioned it before, but we sell to HR, right? That's the B2B buyer. Mm-hmm. For an enterprise, it might be a VP of benefits or a VP of HR. And for a, a hundred person company or even a 10 person company, it might be the CEO who's the decision maker. And when we looked at those personas, predominantly HR, who we sell to, we saw a ton of rational, logical content. So content that helps that person do their job on a day-to-day basis. And I think one of the trends that we were noticing was how we as consumers and everyone in business is a consumer at the end of the day, we're all spending more and more time listening to audio, listening, watching videos. Um, mm-hmm. And so we wanted to tap into that trend, but in a way in which that wasn't being done before. And so that's where the idea of what if we did something in the realm of entertainment, right? So we were we were considering meme accounts. There's some really good like HR meme accounts, <laughs> kind of like poke fun at some of the challenges it is being in HR. I have some of our customers in HR were telling me we did interviews with customers. And a few of them told us about the Slack community. I, I don't know if it's in New York or in the US, but basically there's a channel in this HR community and it's called Into the Void. And it's basically where like HR leaders can just go to this channel. And the one rule is you have to post in the all caps lock. And you essentially <laughs> just like you scream into the void something going on in your day, like a, an employee problem you're having or... And so we started to see and connecting with our customers and knowing them well, that like their job's tough, right? HR is at the center of everything in a company. They're the heart of what makes employees and businesses thrive. And they're also the ones trying to clean things up constantly, right? That many people aren't. Right. So we wanted to empathize with them. We wanted to give them somewhat of a reprieve away from their jobs and, and fun. And so that's how the idea of doing something more in the entertainment space came up. and. We knew we wanted it to be catchy and we knew that the title of it needed to be edgy and also call out the buyer persona really clearly so that they knew who the podcast was for. That's where the name Murder in HR came from. And then, yeah, I think having like top talent like Kate Meyer from House of Cards and Brett, excuse me, Brett Gelman from Stranger Things certainly helped. And I, I think we always thought it would work and it would resonate, but I don't think we realized it would become the number one comedy, like comedic podcast in the US for several months. It was the number one fictional podcast, sorry, fictional comedy podcast in two dozen countries around the world for months. So like it, and I think, I don't even know where the downloads are right now. Last I looked months ago, I think we had over you know, half a million downloads just from 10 episodes that it was, it took on a life of its own. And Interestingly, when we were pitching this internally, some folks, rightly so, were like somewhat concerned by the title and by whether or not this really made sense as part of our marketing strategy. And we were able to convince them this is a good idea. And several of those folks came to us afterwards with stories of prospects that they got onto the phone with who, when they asked them how they heard about Jim Pass at the time, they said they were listening to a podcast and they just kept hearing like mentions of gym class. And then it turned out to be this one. And we were able to back that up with data, right? We use right, Gong right. to record all of our sales calls. And if you search the keyword murder, you can start to see who brings up this word first. <laughs> is it prospects, or customers, right. or is it like us? And more often than not, it was not us. It was prospects and customers because it was like getting shared word of mouth through those communities. And so it was a blast doing this. We're launching season two in a few months with an even bigger and bolder cast. And I think an even 
a punchier storyline for season two. We're really excited about this. And I think to me, this is just one of the areas where I'd love to see marketers start to take more risks, not just in this area, but just in general. I think B2B marketers right. tend to play it safe yeah. a little too much. No. Yeah, no, I agree. I agree. It's more that rational, logical content you started to talk about that they're used to getting. I I just thought this was super interesting. It's exciting that there's going to be a season two. So <laughs> yeah. I'll have to check that out as well. That's pretty cool. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's funny. When we're going through the budgeting process, it was one of the things, like last year for 2024, it was one of the things I was considering cutting because budgeting, you're always right. thinking about every dollar, how can I drive as much revenue? And obviously, this is a little bit more of an influence play. It's harder to measure. <clears throat> and I remember when I even suggested the idea, my chief revenue officer, who is the most data-driven person ever, and I love her, was like, what? You're going to cut that? No. <laughs> when you start to see sales calling out these kinds of things and wanting them to continue, I think that's where you're on to something. I'm glad we trusted our, our intuition with this one. No. Yeah, that's awesome. Uh, awesome. I think it's a great example of, to your point, like how you can make uh, B2B marketing not boring <laughs> and look for interesting experimental ways. But I appreciate the guidance too, because I think this is super important for listeners to think about is that you only earn the right to do these things and these experiments after you've delivered the goods. Yeah, because I think to me, like the, maybe the analogy is when I was at G2 even, right? And, and the board asked me to for a revenue and then they asked me to rebrand the company. I did the rebrand last, right? I, I started to drive revenue. I remember at the end of year one, they asked me like, hey, we asked you to do both of these things, but you only did one. And my feedback to them was like, yeah, like I did the one that I knew was really hard and objective. And... If I crush this one, I knew you wouldn't be able to fire me. And then I've earned the right to like year two work on the rebrand. But if I just did the rebrand and we didn't touch revenue or impact revenue, I don't think that would have been success. I didn't think we could do both of those two things at the same time. And I think this is similar, right? Like you need to prove your worth to the company, which like show your impact. And then that's what you fall back on if the thing that you're testing or piloting or taking the risk on doesn't work, right? Again, you should obviously not be investing more than 5 10% max of your budget on these kinds of things. And Murder and HR, I think, represented less than 1% of my annual budget. So truly a drop in the ocean. But if it didn't great. work, like I, I was very non-concerned with how, how that would go. Awesome. One of the things we like to do on the show is get to know you a little bit better. We know you apparently love wellness gadgets. <laughs> But yeah. my favorite question to ask everybody that comes on is, has there been an experience of your past that defines and makes up who you are today? Such a good question. I ask a really similar question when I'm interviewing candidates, Al, and it's worded <laughs> a little bit differently, but it's essentially, it's, what happened to you like when you were younger that mm. shows up in your adult life that you wish it didn't, essentially? What <laughs> scars, what scar tissue did you develop back then and how does it impact you today? No, that's a, that's a good question. I, I think in school, maybe like early on, I was always like the underdog. I never felt, I always felt like I wasn't enough maybe. And, and I always felt like I needed to prove myself. And I don't know. I think there's, there were some negative consequences and side effects of that for sure. I think mm. that didn't bring out the best in me at all times. But it also, I think, helped me really have a strong drive early on in my career and helped me be really focused on what it was that I was trying to achieve. But I think like I've had to do a lot of therapy since then to like work through like why, why I cared as much as I did about work, why mm. salary and, and money was as important as it was back then. And big surprise, like it was an association with self-esteem, right? And a not very effective one, right? Because there's going to always be someone better than you, richer than you, smarter than you, better looking than you. And so if you get all of your worth from these external things, you're never, ever going to be happy at the end of the day. So yeah, sorry, long answer there really. But I think having a bit of a chip on my shoulder, not feeling like I was enough somewhat really drove me to achieve and to really go deep into marketing, which I love and I'm grateful for it. And also, I think I've grown since then such that I've been able to become a, a more rounded person, less, less sharp edges, maybe. Love it. Thanks for sharing that. And then 
my follow-up question is really around what advice would you give your younger self if you were starting this journey all over again? I don't, oh gosh, I don't know. I don't really regret many things, to be honest. I don't look back on things and wish I did many things differently. Only because I'm, I like where I am today and I've typically liked where I have been in the past. It's not that there weren't better ways to go about things, but any changes there would change where I am today. And I don't know if I would want to necessarily change that. I'd probably, my, maybe my advice should, to my younger self would be to, to get therapy sooner. I think that probably would have been helpful. I didn't really properly invest in, in therapy until like my late 20s. I think that would have served me well to better understand why I did the things that I did or do the things that I do earlier on. And probably would have saved me a lot of, I don't know, internal fighting with myself or beating myself up over things that I didn't really need to. Love it. What is there a topic either you're trying to learn more about yourself or you think marketers need to be learning more about today? Yeah, a channel that I always, I don't want to say always wrote off, but I feel like a channel that historically has been less important to B2B marketing in my mind has been social. Social mm. selling from like a sales perspective has always been an important channel. But I think B2B brands, because of like the creator economy and the way creators are creating these huge communities around them and those communities can then be activated for B2B brands, I think social is actually like a, an area that I've become fallen back in love with, I think, especially from a B2B perspective. And I think just some of the ways even now creators are, I think one of the days is like click the link in my bio or putting like a little link sticker on an Instagram story, right? You're seeing more and more creators say, DM me the words like download course or HR guidelines. And then you're setting up DM automations that then send someone an automated link to maybe an ebook that they can download on a website. So I think like social was a channel that used to be like in the very early days, like a lead gen channel for B2B marketers to post content that was dated. And then naturally all the social platforms didn't want you to leave their platform. So anything that was linking to a page externally wasn't necessarily floated up within mm. the algorithm. And now you're seeing folks, I think, and creators especially create content without links, but then they're then encouraging someone on video and in, in audio to DM them something, which is obviously going to drive more engagement in their own account. I think to me, that's an area I want to learn more about. And I think all marketers should. And I always just think at the end of the day, like when you look at your own behaviors as a consumer, like where do you spend your time? And... I spend the lion's share of my time on Instagram, on YouTube, and on Reddit, I think. And a lot of the stats I've seen show that most people are pretty similar bucket to me. So I think following your own behaviors, looking at what's engaging with you, and then thinking about like the learnings that you can take from that and incorporate into your own marketing, that's probably some of the areas that I'd, I'd be leaning more into. Awesome. Or are there any trends or subcultures that you follow and you think other people should take notice of? Not so much like in the, in the marketing space, but you know, outside of the obvious things, right? I think if you're a marketer and you're not leveraging AI, obviously, like you're going to be left behind. But no, I don't think to me there's any super interesting subcultures right now. Like I, I again, like I said, I think social is really interesting. I think that is constantly being reinvented and the way in which you connect with people is constantly changing there. If I think of trends in wellness, I think like the world is going through a massive wellness, I don't want to say epidemic, because I think actually people are becoming more and more focused on wellness, right? Like right. I stopped drinking alcohol, for example, I don't know, almost five years ago, just for health reasons predominantly. And back then there was one good non-alcoholic beer and now they're just, they're everywhere. There's so many non-alcoholic spirits. <laughs> more and more of my friends are quitting drinking completely. There's just this, I think, massive movement and massive awakening around like what it means to be well, how to eat healthy, how to sleep healthy, how to work out healthy, like all the things that you should be doing right for yourself. And 
I'm loving that trend. And I think that trend cascades into social and on other channels. But I think that trend has certainly helped us grow at the pace we've grown over the last few years. Great. Last question for you. What do you think is the largest opportunity or threat facing marketers today? Yeah. Look, I, I think it, uh, instead of uh, out, out of calling out different like new channels or different new technologies, right. which I think everyone is aware of, to me, I think maybe some of the biggest threats to marketers are just complacency and, and doing what you've always done and expecting different results, right? So I think within that, it's playing it too safe, not taking risks, not connecting what you're doing to revenue to show the impact and the value of it. I think that's the, the biggest threat to marketing, to your company, and even to your career, really, right? No one's going to notice you as you're growing in your career if you aren't driving impact, if you aren't doing things different and, and reinventing things. And maybe then the last thing I'd say here is too, I think that I don't think enough marketers realize how important execution is, right? It's, it's easy to have a good idea, um, but a good idea will fail with poor execution. And I think not enough marketers spend enough time thinking about the details of how to execute something uh, in a way that it'll be successful. To me, there are some of the, the threats to marketers today. Love it. Ryan, this has been fascinating to hear about the rebrand story, how you're marketing to all different constituencies to get to market, and then obviously all the personal stuff as well. Thank you Thanks, so much Alan. for coming on the show. Yeah, it's great to be here. And look, if any of your listeners want WellHub, we launched this. It's a beta, but it's a marketing campaign that we're about to launch. It's called wewantwellhub.com. So if you go to wewantwellhub.com, you can basically validate like through who you are for your company email address and then create a petition for your company to then basically petition your company for WellHub. And so we count the number of people at your company that have petitioned it. And this becomes a public page that you can send to HR to show them like how people want this thing. So I'm excited about that. So if anyone listening here wants their company to get WellHub, check out wewellhub.com. Awesome. I love that. I love that. Love that. Thank you again. Thanks, Alan. Good to chat as always. Hi, it's Alan again. Marketing Today was created and produced by me with post-production support from Sam Robertson. If you're new to Marketing Today, please feel free to write us a review on iTunes or your favorite listening platform. Don't forget to subscribe on marketingtodaypodcast.com. Tell your friends and colleagues about the show. I love hearing from listeners. You can contact me at marketingtodaypodcast.com. There you'll also find complete show notes and links to what was discussed in the episode today, and you can search our archives. I'm Alan Hart, and this is Marketing Today. Be ready no matter what the temperature with Crop Metcalf's $99 heating and cooling system check. Call 1-800-GO-CROP or visit CropMetcalf.com. Crop Metcalf is the one with five stars. Crop Metcalf, home of the five-star technician.